All right, we're back to playing Kentucky Route Zero. Pretty much the last couple of episodes here. Act three is particularly long, though, so we may be able to squeeze three out of it. We are where the strangers are from. Coming out of this mausoleum. Oh, that's right. I suppose I have to click on it to get us out. Conway's new leg. Everybody has to get out of there. Got a whole crew with us now. Well, this can't be right. It looks like an old church. It's muddy. Yeah, that's what he said. Crystals and then mud. Okay. I want to stay outside. Okay. I'll stay with him. We can look for lizards. Okay, we'll make it quick. Do they make it quick? That's right, I gotta look at all of the headstones. Fairly tedious task. What you'll find out about uh, all of these headstones is that they are all game developers. I don't believe they're all game developers that worked on this game, but they are game developers. I haven't gone into deep detail to find out if any of the things that are written on the markers, other than the names, uh, correlate to any of their games at all, but gonna make Ezra look at the headstones. This is the one thing about Kentucky Route Zero that is oh, that was my birthday for that one. Uh the thing about Kentucky Route Zero that isn't always um, so pleasant is that there is occasionally a lot of reading that you have to go through. Not that reading is bad, of course, but you know sometimes when you just want to play the game through to the end, and one of the goals is to read everything around you. The museum was like that. One more. Seem reasonable. All right. Let's talk to Junebug. What are we going to say? I wasn't really looking. <laughs> Is that guy your boyfriend? I think that's what I picked the last time too, but you wouldn't know because I didn't actually record it. I meant to. But Fraps wasn't up. And the entirety of the last two or three episodes this never got taped. So here I am doing them again. At least I know what I'm doing this time. Ah, uh, Julian the bird. Well, there, now you're getting specific. I don't think we see the bird anymore. Well, at least not for now. It is only Act 3, after all. It's supposed to be a five-act game. And developing it as it goes along. Let's see what Conway has to say. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of crazy down there. We get, to, we get to that a little bit later. I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but... Uh, we do sort of flash back to the church in what is inside. 
Now we're back at the Hollow Mountain King with Donald, who we will of course talk to. I've got a cold today, so don't mind me. Trace an orbit around the road and close your eyes with holy dread for we on mold and whiskey fed and drank from rivers down below. We found you strangers. We know how to fix your damn machine, but I'm not sure it was worth it. Oh, soon the visions will return. What have you found? Let's just say you need to type in the specific phrase to restore it. Yes, yes we will. We will type away. Let's just go straight to Xanadu. It's no point in talking to these other people. Do they have something interesting to say? I don't know. Too much dialogue to begin with. Round and round and round we go where we stop. Xanadu. Now the Xanadu part is a little grating on the ears, it's kind of weird and I don't know if you'll enjoy it. Feel free to skip it, we'll end the episodes after, this episode anyway, after using Xanadu. So if this is a little too much for you to take, uh, feel free to just go to the next episode. <laughs> Get her going. And end of road. There's a quaint little house coming on here. Shake it up a bit, shall we? Standing at the end of a road before a small brick building around in the forest. Check out the building. You know, like a choose your own adventure game or one of those old text Zork games. Having guests, this part, these parts going forward are what I mean by being a little abrasive. We're inside a building storage shed for the National Park Service. There's a sensible modern electrical lantern nearby. Yeah, let's get the lantern. Taken. Exit building. Enter forest. That's not the only thing you can enter. So we'll go north. Apparently north. You're in open forest with a deep valley to one side. Can climb a tree? Climb tree. I don't think much is to be achieved by that. Sorry. Can we dig a hole? Dig a hole. You can't see any such thing. Limited vocabulary. South. We're in forest. Hey, it's a maze. East. East. We're in forest. Blue is here. Solder replacement components and a small handmade radio. We should definitely talk to her. We asked Lala how she's doing. Hi, Donald. I'm getting the strangest interference out here. I've been tuning the radio circuits gradually as we go, swapping capacitor values and tweaking resistor networks. It was working for a while, but everything I can pick up sounds so distant and muffled. Lula hands you the radio. Oh, maybe you'll have better luck. You're good at this stuff. Just don't forget to give it back. West. West. You're in forest. Joseph is here tapping with a small stylus on a modified pocket bracelet. A small gray kitten, no more than a few weeks old, dozes comfortably on top of his backpack. Maybe he has something to say. 
Don't know, I was just transcribing your footsteps. Sounded like Joseph runs his finger along the index card he's been tapping on from right to left. Long weary song, truly gone, dearly gone. You beat a melancholy shuffle through these woods, Donald. Ha! I'm noting down the sounds of the forest with an ear for speech and an inborn filter for poetry, I suppose. So maybe it's me being melancholy after all. I'm eager to see what the poetic subsystem makes of these punch cards. West some more. What will we find? At edge of hole. They are at the edge of a massive hole. The dirt gives way to rock as the ground sinks into darkness. The computer tied to your upper back slickens with sweat in the afternoon sun. The rope slung around your shoulder has slipped under the strap of your backpack, taking uncomfortably against your collar. Yes, let's shine the lamp. Into the hole. Your lamp is now on. The lamplight only reaches a few yards down the hole, where the rock is coated in a slimy black mold. You can tell that the walls are too slick to climb safely without assistance. Let's, let's try using the rope. Tied to a tree! The rope is tied snugly to a tree trunk. Now, your feet slip a few times on the slimy rock, but you remain stable. Lula and Joseph descend carefully after you. And now in bed quilt. <laughs> Odd name, don't mind me, I have a cold. I may have told you that already, but if in case you missed that, I do have a cold. <laughs> bed quilt's a cave. You are in bed quilt. A long east-west passage with holes everywhere. Joseph and Lula remove the computer equipment they are carrying on their backs and begin setting up. That's the last trip, so everything's down here now. Set up the gear. I only understood you as far as wanting to set up. Set the up above. Set the up above. <laughs> Lola looks pensive. Ask her about the cave. Having second thoughts, I don't blame you. It's unsettling down here. Weird acoustics. Earlier, as we were climbing down, I thought I heard voices for a moment, or not voices themselves, but the echoes of voices singing some kind of eerie, tuneless working song. I'm glad I'm not down here alone. What's the gear they're carrying? Ask Lula about gear. Sure, Donald, we may as well take inventory. I've got the tape machine and the synthesizer parts we borrowed from the School of Music. It's all tuned up to my voice, so we won't have to type so much. Joseph. Joseph. <laughs> Joseph has a slate in the punch cards he's transcribed from the poems we read him. He's got the typewriter and the paper tape reader. And you've got the CRT display. How's your back holding up? And Joseph looks uncomfortable. Hey Donald, can you help me uh, wire up these generators? I'll assemble the synthesizer, but I could use some help with the serial interface if you have time. You hear an unfamiliar echo from a tunnel to the east. Yes, let's help Lula. Thanks Donald, I can never remember which color lead goes to which pin. Lula begins unpacking a box of wires and terminals. Do you think there are paintings down here? Cave paintings, I mean? Maybe some old pottery shards from when the world was young and early men and women huddled in these caves, too? Do you know, I think cultural fossils are the saddest fossils. Sadder than animal remains, I mean. We might come across a petrified mollusk or a partial dinosaur footprint, and we say, there was a point of contact here where a body touched the earth. And maybe there's a little bit of evidential garbage, but the life who owned that body never cared and has moved on anyway. And that's the end of it. But suppose I shine my lantern on one of these walls and I see a crude painting thousands of years old, two men and a woman, charcoal and blood on rock. Someone put that there to keep something on the rock after she passed, a hope, a relationship, or a moment, a worry, maybe, a regret. She made a painting to keep something alive for her, but like that dead mollusk and that itinerant dinosaur, she had to move on. Whatever it was is gone, and now we're looking at this painting, this dangling copy with no original. You are interrupted by the ominous echo of a grating, scraping sound from the east, louder than before. What the hell was that? 
Let's check it out. Let's check it out. In the tunnels, the mighty tunnels, the Conway sleeps tonight. In the tunnels, the bed quilt tunnels, the Conway sleeps tonight. Bing! down the tunnel with Joseph and Lula close behind. Yeah, how do you like all this, kid? Yeah, we're all good at a lot of reading, aren't we? Tunnel arrows, and soon you find yourself crawling on your hands and knees. Navigating the tunnel gradually becomes more awkward as smooth rock gives way to jagged, crystalline surfaces. Scratches and taps echo from the end of the tunnel, some short and piercing, some slower and groaning as it dampens Crystal room. And there's a stranger. <laughs> Hello, stranger. You're in a large, irregular chamber. The walls, floor, and ceiling are covered with crystalline projections. Strangers are here, scraping black mold from the crystals. They look up when you enter. One of them seems about to speak. Yeah, let's listen to what he says. The stranger reaches for a box he's carrying and presses a plastic button. The box whirs to life, and a crackly voice blurts something unintelligible and then slows to a deep gurgle. He looks at his companions momentarily in confused disappointment, and he returns his awful gaze to you. Joseph flees through a tunnel to the north. Lula flees through a tunnel to the northeast. We follow Lula, of course. Run north. Lula's headlamp scans across the northern passage as you run. Soft shadows loom perplexingly from floor to ceiling. You feel around to distinguish shadows from crystals, but eventually you find yourself cornered. You have hit a dead end. Let's comfort her. Comfort Lula. You reassure Lula that the strangers are harmless. Are you... are you sure? Maybe you're right, it sounds like they've gone back to work. All right, let's try to pass them quickly now. Don't make eye contact. Then we'll find our way back to the equipment. Back to bed quilt. To bed quilt we go. Uh, you're in bed quilt along the east-west passage with holes everywhere, as per usual. Lula is here, panting for breath. Did they follow us? Where is Joseph? Search for Joseph. I only understood you as far as wanting to search. To be more specific. Back outside. Search outside. You grab hold of the rope and slowly climb up. Your days lecturing on esoteric computer science topics did not prepare you to scale cave walls with a rope. Your evenings gathering with friends to roll dice and consult fancifully illustrated charts, however, prepared you for the likelihood that this climb could end badly. You carefully descend back into the cave. Let's search with the equipment then. The various computer and audio equipment cast angular shadows into the tunnels as you scan slowly across the pile. Nothing. Joseph emerges suddenly from one of the tunnels. That damn sound, those damn voices. I don't even know what direction I was running. I wove through that network of tunnels. I ran my hand along the wall, always turning left. But every turn and every rock felt the same. For all I knew, I was running in circles. Finally, I ended up here. And I hid. I panicked. I heard you talking, but I didn't think I could trust my senses. But listen, there's one thing I have to tell you. While I was out there lost in the tunnels and caves, I came across the zero, and I had no idea. It's like a real place. They pick up garbage, they deliver mail, they go to work and to church, but it has an awful kind of emptiness. Wandering through, I heard horrible echoes, weird images got burned in my mind's eye. A television, a scarecrow, a crystal, a feather, a sandwich, a CRT monitor, a bottle, an anchor. Lola looks down at her feet. We should ask him more about that. Donald, you've heard the same damn story as I have, but it's different. It doesn't matter now, damn it. I believe it. To hell with all of it. Yes, we should stop him. Stop Joseph. You shout something at Joseph about the project you were working on together. You'll die in these damn cold caves, and what about those men? You know they'll come back. 
we can hide from the strangers, Joseph. He shouts something at Joseph about going deeper into the caves. Did you hear their voices? They're not. They'll find you, but not me. I'm going back to the surface. Stop, your stupid fight is ringing through the whole damn cave. Joseph is right, we can't stay here. I'm leaving too, but I'm not going back to the surface. I'm taking my station wagon and I'm heading down the zero. I think we need him to stay. I will plead with Lula about your continued collaboration. I'll send you this tape when I'm done recording. I'll put it in the mail, and then you can see what your damn machine does with it. Lula and Joseph have left. In the tunnels again. As Donald, we stay there. Abandoned by your collaborators, your confidants, your companions, the only two among your colleagues with whom you've ever trusted the gift of your friendship. Pretty thick, sounds like Beardo and his are broken. You wander the tunnels alone, dragging along the components of your unrealized masterpiece, combing the underground passages for a new site in which to realize your vision. Sounds like a genius. How do you mean? Pain. Vanity, ain't it the truth? My Aunt Remedios, before she got into the whole ethnomusicography thing, she was a painter. Mostly nudes and oil. She had this model. I'll never forget him. Big, classically physical guy. Looked like he was about to storm Troy. Made everyone call him the Colonel. Weaver and I saw this guy naked a lot. You couldn't help it. He was always posing somewhere in the house, chasing the light from room to room, while Aunt Remedios made a sketch of his profile or worked on the right mix of pigments for his abdomen. Colonel had this magnificent hair, long black hair that ran down just to the bottom of his shoulder blades. One evening he was standing next to an open window in the back of the house. The sun was setting early spring, I think. It was kind of windy. Aunt Remedios was trying to get his hair straight. She kept rearranging it, like half in front and half behind, running over his shoulder and laying across his chest in this very specific way. But it itched him or something, and he'd do this weird, indignant shuffle thing. Or the wind from the open window would push it around, or he'd start and turn his neck when Weaver or I ran by and everything would be tangled again. The final product was a swirl of black lines billowing around the top of his neck. Weird thing is, I don't even remember his face now, and just that black swirl, probably the best one she ever painted. Cool story, bro. <laughs> Back to the Hall of the Mountain King. You can hear my cat Corin meowing ponderously in the background as he wants to get out, but I'm not going to end this uh, episode until Xanadu is Xanadun. Let's poke it, shall we? After what may have been years, you stumble out of a tunnel into a cavernous open space. Stalactites adorn the ceiling like grotesques, and the center of the room is an enormous rocky spar. This is where you will set up your equipment and establish your legacy. Okay, now Xanadu inside Xanadu. It's Xanaception. Now is the time to continue your work. Research Assistant Zero Realism Index. 37%. Romance Index. 2%. Mold Coverage. 0%. You may hire a new research assistant, assign assistance to a task, or sleep until tomorrow. Well, we should hire a new assistant, not that any of this matters, because... You just end up backing up out of the whole thing anyway, and none of this really does anything. We hired Weaver! Well, we knew where Weaver was. We're gonna assign Weaver! Do debugging. Assigning available research assistance to debugging. Sleep. Time passes. We were fixing some weird math with some weird math. Now is the time to continue your work. Research assistance one. Realism index. 47%. Romance index. 2%. Chance of uh, scattered showers. Mold coverage 10%. You may hire a new research assistant. Assign assistant to a task or sleep until tomorrow. We will hire a new research assistant. Yeah, we got Andrew who studies statistics. We will assign assistants to a task. Yes. Debugging. Two research assistants. One to debugging. 
Assigning assistance. Speculation. Sleep. Time passes. Weaver makes adjustments to the echolocation algorithm. Bats now fly normally instead of getting hung up on each other's wings and clustering together like horrible leathery tumbleweeds. Andrew makes a convincing argument for the edibility of stone. Grassy, greasy. Grassy, greasy or grassy black mold is collecting on the computer equipment. Now is the time to continue with your work. Two research assistants. 52% romance index. Romance index of 17%. That's just enough for 50 shades of gray. We're going to hire a new research assistant. Alright, Rick. He studies library sciences. Signing assistants. This is the part of the video that you may just want to fast forward. One to debugging. One to speculation. One to transcription. Sleep. Time passes. Rick widens tunnel slightly to reduce the need for extra crouch command. Weaver types up some lurid imagery from a dream journal, and Andrew muses about the lovely lives of fungal colonies. Intruders! The strangers are doing something to the equipment, but you can't make out what. You hide behind a rock until they leave. With trepidation, you emerge from your hiding place hours later. Now is the time to continue work. You know that they took the moles. Not getting us any closer to zero. FLA is nuts, but we have a 47% realism and romance index, which is the first time in 20 years. Oh, let's try to quit and start over. Yeah, we got stuff to do. Quit. Yes. Exit. Turn in anything at the moment. Smash the computer. Smash computer. Violence isn't the answer to this one. Maybe we have to wait it out. Wait indefinitely. Time passes. Research assistants come and go. One of them, the mathematician named Weaver, follows the strangers into the tunnels. She doesn't return, but neither do they. Years pass. Mold accumulates. You and the remaining research assistants take to burning disused equipment in the center of the room. The black mold is intensely flammable and makes an excellent catalyst. It leaves behind a sweet, narcotic perfume. One night, you have visitors, outsiders, different ones. Then later that night, an old friend. You really did go deeper into the caves. Premature on the file. Press any key to quit. Where's the any key? I don't see the any key. Do it. <laughs> and that, my friend, is Xanadu. And next, we'll be doing scene 10 from Act 3. Still in the Hall of the Mountain King. But for now, goodbye.